Uh, kia ora everybody, welcome. My name is Jane and I'm moderating the session today. What I'd love to do to kick us off is um, the session today is on health and wellbeing and its connection to youth work. And I think we need to start by thinking about our own wellbeing just to ground ourselves into the space and into the space that we have together for the next wee while. So for that, I would like to um, share with you what we call a karakia from Aotearoa, New Zealand. So a karakia is like a prayer and it's used by Māori to open a space and we also use the same process to close a space. Uh, I'll be using the same karakia this afternoon uh, when we are running our, our session um, in, in the auditorium and you guys are like the guinea pigs, okay? So if you do it well here this afternoon, we'll have it sorted. So the prayer that I'm going to share with you honours and acknowledges the sky and the heavens, acknowledges the land, what we would call the whenua that we are standing on together. And it also acknowledges all the people of the world. Uh, you'll hear the word aisle in it. The word aisle means peace. And I think that's a beautiful karakia for us to acknowledge in the conference that we're in, yeah, to build towards a peaceful um, society together. So, uh, so that's the karakia, it's quite short. At the end, I'll say the phrase tihe and then mauri ora. Uh, that's how uh, we would finish a, a karakia in New Zealand. Mauri ora means the breath of life. Um, so that is the thing that will close us together. So that's the part I would like your help with. So I will, you will hear after quite a short little um, thing in Reo Māori. So in the language of Māori, you'll hear me say tihe, and then I'd love us to say together mauri ora. So let's practice that. It's two words. The first word is mauri. And the second word is ora. 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 Yeah, so mauri ora. ora. And if you don't get it right, it's okay because you know that what it means is the breath of life. We're, we're acknowledging the breath that will come into this karakia to ground us or land us here together. So I'll start now. You're welcome to um, actually, what I might get you to do is, is close your eyes, put your feet on the ground, and we're just going to do a couple of breaths. And then I'll say the karakia, and at the end I'll say tihe, and together we'll say mauri ora. So if you breathe in with me, breathe out, and breathe in, and breathe out. Ayo ki te rangi, ayo ki te whenua, ayo ki na tangata o te ao. Tihe Mauri ora. Thank you, friends, for joining me in that space. Before I introduce you to our amazing panelists, we wanted to give you a chance to talk to people next to you who you might not already know. Uh, and our whanau online, our friends online, we would like you to do the same thing using your chat function. What we'd like you to do is with the person next to you, if you can, in two minutes, find three things you have in common. It can be anything. Okay, but three things you have in common. Online, we thought if you can use the chat function to see if you can find one thing that all of you have in common besides that you love young people. <laughs> so two minutes, and then I'll introduce you to the panelists. Okay, friends, we're going to come back together. You can continue that conversation at lunchtime uh, so that will have kick-started us. How many people found three things? Yeah, most of the room did. That's, that's good. That's wonderful. <laughs> Um, friends, we have an incredible panel uh, of people today who have just so much wisdom for us to, um, to, to absorb. No pressure. Um, so the first uh, speakers that we have, uh, so you can see the title up here. And what I did in preparing was I just looked at those words that popped out to me. Um, so the words that popped out to me were partnerships, were youth voice, were positive outcomes. And I mean, I think we all agree that that's what we need for the well-being of our young people. So Munya is um, has an excellent love of maths, I read in his bio, uh, or possibly the opposite of that <laughs> that I see from the bio. Um, and uh, like many by chance, stumbled into youth work and now leads many programs supporting young people to flourish. Um, and his right hand person is, um, is Tamsin, who I was like, I read her bio, and she studied music and psychology and lived in Spain. And I was like, well, that's an interesting combination. <laughs> um, so uh, the lived experience lead for the Commonwealth Youth Program Health Team um, and the key focus of your work that I was reading up about was the ideas of youth voice being embedded and that idea of youth with 
work that we do together. So exciting um, first speakers for us uh, in our, our wellbeing workshop today. Thank you. Does everyone to get their phones up first because we're actually going to do a Slido, which you would have probably practiced in the first session. Yes, we're going to try and work out the ten. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Good. Excellent. And online as well. Please feel free to wave so that I can yes. see you. We'll so it. please use a slider and uh, ans answer the question. We want to know where you, you've come from to get here. You might have just, like Barry, come um, rolled out of bed literally to come here. Um, we have come from Kent, which about two hours drive from here. Well, actually, two, two and a half. I live in right the, the right corner of Kent by the coast. I'm got, not going to complain because I have uh, lovely views of the sea. Wow, Glasgow. I love Glasgow. Uh, excellent. But nice mix. Yeah, Essex, that's what she is. Oh, we've got a little smiley face, yeah, so someone's like happy this morning. All in my jumping. Brilliant. <laughs> Amazing. New Zealand, obviously, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Some people yeah. were okay. So thank yeah. you, everyone. Let's move on to the next one. So do so, you work? Sorry, Munyan, did you want to? Do you work with young people in your services? So not just work um, for them or with them, but actually in developing services. So when you're doing co-production. Oh, okay. got a few already. So maybe we should just head out. Yeah, sure. We're going to go get a coffee. <laughs> yeah, and one of you is going to have to present. Because we've got all my people. Okay, but well, we've got to know them. Well, thank you very much for that. Right. So welcome to, um, to the session. Um, my name is Munya. I live in Kent. Um, I've lived in Kent for just over 20 years. Live in Ashford, which uh, used to be the gateway to Europe. Um, and there we go. Um, so hopefully I'm think so. I'm Tamsin, I'm the lived experience lead for young adults, and I work within Kent and Medway ICB, which stands for Integrated Care Board, which is basically the commissioning teams that we have here in the United Kingdom. Excellent. So I thought we will start uh by so with the N NHS. Uh, I'm sure many of you, especially if you're in the UK, know what the NHS is, the National Health Service. Um, and you will also know that the 5th of July last week was celebrating the 70th anniversary of the NHS. So maybe a little bit of an applause for happy birthday, NHS. <laughs> Looking after the cake later, guys. <laughs> um, and I am really proud to have been involved in a little bit of that NHS journey uh, through the work that we do here with young people. I've only been in the NHS for less than two years, but the learning journey is incredible. It's exciting. So I thought first, you know, just try and explain what uh, the NHS is. And as you will know, if every organization that you work with, they go through a transition. And if you've gone 75 years, there will always be a transition because things change all the time. So we have uh, what is called an integrated care system um, across England. And that's basically a partnership that brings together NHS organizations, local government, and a lot of other organizations um, to take collective responsibility for the delivery of health and care and reduce health inequalities in an area. And there are two components to this um, integrated care system. Kent and Midway is one of those integrated care systems, it's one of the 42. So we look after a population of 1.8 million. So within that are two components, the integrated care board and the integrated care system. Like hands in articulated area, the integrated care board or ICBs are responsible for the funding and planning of that service and the integrated care partnerships are the committees that support that, those strategies as well. So we operate, Kent is, is a large area, like I said, it's 1.8 million um, as a population. A lot of it is around the cost, so if you look at the map, we have these what we call place-based partnerships and there are four of them. Now I'm employed uh, since the 1st of July to support the East Kent version of that. And that's a population of nearly 800,000 people that we look after. And there are four of these, not equally distributed by population necessarily, but we have those. And then we have underneath that, what do we call it, place-based or uh, primary care network on a local, more local perspective, rather smaller. So there are a lot of partnerships that have to be developed 
on a bigger scale, as you can see from that ICS, the integrated care system, all the way granular to the individual, to, to the local districts in that. But I, I'm involved in workforce, broad words pro probably, but as you will have heard, especially if you're in this country, uh, we need more people to work in the NHS and in social care. We have a lot of vacancies, so we have to think about how we work um, with our partners to do that. So a lot of our work is based on um, what I do anyway, is aligning what I do with the priorities of, of uh, the ISCAN Healthcare Partnership, which are, you know, fit into the ICS system. So that work um, is, for my work around Workstream, is around promoting East Kent as a great place to live and work. I mean, times and years, how far from the beach? Not too far. 100 yards? <laughs> 100 yards. Um, I don't quite live 100 yards. I'm about 15 miles away from, from the seaside. I don't go there as often um, at all. But we, you know, it's about promoting that place as a great place for people to, to work. But also maximizing the supply of health and social, uh, people into health and care. And that's really important for us. And as you can see on there, you know, especially with Workstream One, it's about attracting people into health and care. And a lot of my work is really working with young people. It's about inspiring um, young people to be aware of what is available in health and care. There are over 350 roles in health and care, including mine. So probably chances are when you might have known that I'm from the NHS, you thought I'm a clinician. Please do not trust me with the scaffold, okay? Mm -hmm. I cannot uh, do any of that work at all. And in fact, I've never been in the hospital just to have a tour until recently when I started working with the NHS. Interesting space to work in, but that's what you do. So to be able to deliver this work, we have to work with a lot of partners. And these are just some of the examples of the partners that we work with. Obviously, we are trying to find spaces where you can find young people. And that is, you know, obviously universities, local FE colleges, youth centers, um, local schools and colleges, including primary school. So we're working with a lot of partners just to try and coordinate and align what we're doing with um, what other organizations are doing as well in those strategies. So obviously you've got NHS there. We have NHS is broad, there are over 600 NHS organizations, but most people probably think it's one organization, which is it is in some sense, but not quite uh, at all. So what have we been doing to try and engage young people? to try and work with all these partners for the benefit of that, for providing and getting people into health and care. And the little work that we have been doing, you know, starts from, you know, the, the one on, the, on, the, on my right, your left, students planting trees. What you will see is in February, if you are again in this country, February is cold, very, very cold. So we had a group of girls planting trees at our mental health hospital. The first time that the particular NHS trust has done that. And the reason why we, want, we wanted these young people, yes, to experience health and care um, um, environment, but also to understand that even if you work in a mental health hospital, treating somebody with mental health issues or well-being issues is not necessarily about clinical interventions. There are other ways as well, like Jane has uh, shown as well uh, at the beginning of this session. So with young people planting trees, um, it doesn't stop there. We also want to engage college tutors so that because they are the people who are spending a lot more time with students, uh, probably more time than they do at home. So we want to en enable those guys um, in, in colleges to understand what happens in health and health care. So we took them to the medical engineering department, EDR, equality, diversity and inclusion and careers, photography students who didn't know that they could use their photography school doing digital imaging in health and care services. Uh, Included that is these members of our staff sharing their culture, what they bring to the NHS service, the social care service, and also why they love working in healthcare because we employ a diverse range of people in health and care. But again, we talk about core design and core delivery, and, and Tamsin will spend a lot of time actually talking and articulating that. Um, from a career perspective, from a workforce perspective, that one on the top left, uh, or my um, your top right, actually, is called production. We asked the young people, 35 young people aged 13 to 16, what they thought, um, how we to design a program that um, is fit for them in terms of for promoting careers. So a lot of the work that we produce, obviously, as adults, you know, if you're close to, to 50 as I am, I'm designing things that I think are useful. But for the younger generation, you have to design something different. So we went to them to ask them to co-design some of that resources. And there are a lot of other uh, partnerships there. 
The one that I also bring up, which is really important, because I talk about young people, I talk about teachers, I haven't talked about parents yet, but there's a partnership working here in the middle, bottom here, with our own um, health and care providers. Different people from different teams coming together to look at what their priorities are. And so therefore, how do we bring those priorities together in some way, because they will be synergy. So these are some of the programs that you are doing. One of the programs I'm really proud of is the youth volunteering, because we know young people want to get involved in health and care services. So my colleague Mandy designed this program and we have nearly 40 young people for the first time who are aged 16 and 17 who are volunteering in NHS um, mm. in East Kent for the first time. So we are listening to what young people are, are saying. So this is one other program that we are delivering, Nursing Cadet Program. Um, as you can see here, there's a 16, 17 year olds going for the first time um, learning how to make a bed with a flat sheet. Now, if you are in UK um, or Europe, you probably have fitted sheets. Probably where you're sleeping, you might have fitted sheets. Um, mm -hmm. Now, doing a bed, flat bed sheets, um, that's a, a challenge um, mm -hmm. to say the least. But these young people have just graduated last Thursday, absolutely love the program. And all the 12 young people who completed the program want to work in health and care. But what we also do, which is really important, is at the end of each program, we evaluate listening to the young people's feedback and adapt our programs going forward to make sure that it is fit for those particular young people. And that's really important. But actually, Hamzin has got more exciting stuff that she can talk about in terms of week experience. So over to you. Should I watch this video? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Seems that we want to watch this video yeah. a lot. It's really keen. <laughs> <laughs> Just as keen as those flat sheets. So, hi, so I'm Hamden. I'm the lived experience lead for young adults. Um, and I sit within the Kent and Medway commissioning team as their lived experience lead. So what is lived experience? Some of you may have come across it. Some of you may not have before. Um, basically, it is what it says on the tin. It's any experience that you've lived. We've all been to a conference now, so we have lived experience of going to a conference. My lived experience comes from my mental health experiences. So I was a young adult that had mental health experiences, and now I use that to support young people and connect with young people over what they're going through, or what they've been through, because I've been through it myself. So I advocate and amplify their voice and create partnerships between them and voluntary sector organisations, I'm doing really well, aren't I, already? Um, voluntary sector organisations, commissioning teams, local authorities to make sure their voice is being embedded within commissioning decisions and service design. Service delivery and design cannot go forward without using co-production and using lived experience. It's not working, something's not going right. And I think we saw yesterday when um, we saw about the Hope Collective, for those of you who were here yesterday, when the Hope Collective programmes were um, co-designed and designed wholly by the people using them, there was a great success and that just um, exponentially grew. We currently rely on a lot of data-based provision and a lot of statistics, and actually that doesn't necessarily reflect the true experience of a young person. Um, they are not a number. They are a real person. And when we start listening to those experiences, we actually start getting what they're going through. We get that richness of that qualitative data. I think a big problem at the moment, and Professor Salah mentioned yesterday in his amazing presentation, which I really enjoyed, um, about a, a lack of genuine participation. So another part of my role is to make it non-tokenistic. You might have things called key performance indicators where you have to, um, it says you have to um, engage with young people as part of your project. And people speak to five people, five young people, maybe even one, 
and tick a box on their sheet and say, yes, I've engaged with young people, have they? Anyone think that that's true engagement with young people? Yes, um, everyone's shaking their please. heads and somebody shouted no, exactly. That's not true co-production. So I go in and where there are commissioning projects um, or they're working on strategies, I say, right, have you non-tokenistically engaged with young people? We then work with participation workers who work in places like local authority. Um, and there are groups, there are some amazing community groups doing amazing work already. So we speak to them and say, look, can you get us a cohort of young people? We want to see them once a month for the next six months whilst we're delivering this strategy, let's say. And then when the strategy is delivered or the programme is delivered, we go back to them and say, is it what you thought it was or do we need to change it a little bit? Um, so making sure it's not that one person sitting in a coffee shop for half an hour is continued engagement. So with this, this is new and we are testing out ideas and we need to set out guidelines for what we need to consider for children and young people. So with that comes systemic asks and I've written them down here because I want to make sure I don't, don't forget any of them. So when I go to commissioners, when I go to heads of service and execs, they need to advocate and amplify the lived experience voice. I can shout from a rooftop, but people won't hear me. They are strategically in a position to be able to amplify that lived experience voice. So I go and sit on their meetings and say, do you know what lived experience is? Why not? Why aren't you using it? Can you tell people more? So with that as well it's getting their money where their mouth is they need to be commissioning roles like mine and supporting other lived experience roles upskilling there may be lived experience people that have um gaps in their cv because they got very mentally unwell and were unable to work if you see a, a gap on a cv what are you going to think oh they weren't working but it doesn't mean their skill set is is any less than that of another candidate that doesn't have that if anything they're bringing a raw quality of their lived experience to it that actually gives them a perspective that not a lot of people do and um, my role is the first in the county um, and we're pioneering and trailblazing that um, and i'd like to say it's working well i'm standing here in front of you so i work more strategically so it's commissioning those roles they also need to continue dialogue and share that with wider audiences so it's no, no point me going to sit in their meeting and then they say, cool, really great to hear from you. Thank you for coming. They need to then talk to their seniors and their seniors. And then that needs to go regionally and nationally um, and today internationally. So I'm going to hold you all to account. I need you to be spreading the word of lived experience. With change comes resistance. And I have felt that. Um, people see me as a poorly person, not a professional. Um, yes, I have mental health diagnoses, um, but I am also a professional. Um, and I'm working, I really enjoy working strategically. And yes, I have had employment gaps, but that doesn't make me any less competent at my role. Um, so we were talking about partnerships. Please, would we be able to go to the next slide? So partnership working, this is what we're talking about facilitating relationships between all of these people so as i was saying earlier about commissioning and project roles i'm working currently with two people from local authority um, when if there is anybody outside of the uk local authority to us is council so regional councils i work with kent county council and medway council um, i'm currently working um, with a couple of um, colleagues from local authority on developing a lived experience framework. This is very new and we want to make sure we're doing it right, that we're implementing protective factors for people with lived experience, that we're looking after the young people that we're engaging with and keeping them safe because they've got severe mental illness or um, sort of complex mental health experiences. We need to talk about, I think in the, the um, plen opening plenary this morning, it was mentioned that a lot of youth work people volunteer why should a young person give their expertise on their lived experience and then the person in the room get paid to talk to them because that's their expertise so i for me i really push remuneration for um any input from young people so we're developing that so that's just some of the partnership working um, so I'm actually employed by a community interest company, um, but I sit within the commissioning team, which is the NHS. So I work in the sort of social enterprise sector, but I sit in the NHS. So that's 
that's near the partnership working there, it gives me an independent voice. So when I'm talking to young people, I don't just have this NHS agenda behind me. I work in the community. Um, running engagement events with and between groups. I recently ran a conference, one of the most stressful days of my life, but we did it and I'll come on to that a little bit later. Um, and also commissioning and supporting the VCSE sector, so voluntary, tra voluntary charity and social enterprise organisations, who a lot of the time hold the support for young people. Let's face it, they're the ones in the community supporting young people um, when they've been let down by what we call the system. Um, I would like to say the, the system I work in, so the Kent and Medway Children Young People's Mental Health ICB, they are incredible and I really hope that and really wish that children and young people got to see their passion and the fact that they're really trying to push and get the right care for children and young people and one of those ways is by putting lived experience into their team and then they got stuck with me so um if we can move to the next slide please that'd be wonderful um so last year um those who of you who are from the UK may have heard of these community mental health transformations. So basically, um, each area of um, the UK got central funding from the NHS um, to do a transformation of their community mental health teams. So that's what we call secondary care. So that's sort of a bit more complex intervention than your sort of short term CBT or counselling, and it's more severe mental illness. We put in Kent and Medway a lived experience team that had an equal weight in conversation as the clinical team when developing the model, which is called Mental Health Together. Um, my email is at the end if you want more information on that, because um, I'm not going to go into all of it now. It's too, too long. Um, but in a year, we, so with three of us on the team, so myself, the lived experience lead for the team, and a lived experience lead for complex emotional difficulties, which some of us know as personality disorders. Um, and then later in the year, we um, we employed a lived uh, a lived experience lead for IAPT talking therapy, so primary care. We engaged with thirty four people a week. So in a year, we've got one thousand six hundred and twenty six people mm -hmm. with experiences in mental health services. And we continued. That wasn't just one engagement. We continued to talk to them when it's being trailblazed. At the moment in Medway, we are still talking to them and um, we're saying, OK, right, this was the model. Is it working how you thought? How would you change that? And I just quite like that because we worked so hard on this model. We have five minutes. So I'm going to just quickly run through um, the last couple of bits. Um, young people's voice. OK, so we ran an event at the beginning of last year and it became apparent that stakeholders um, commissioners, young people, their, their carers, parents, families um, wanted a consistent platform to be able to feedback on their mental health care. So I project manage something called the Young People's Voice. This is a 24-7 online form that people can feedback their mental health experiences. So it's for a 16 to 25 year old, so it's young adults. Um, but it can also be their teachers, it can be their families, it can be their friends. We take all of that data, we theme it, and then we take that to the commissioners and say, look, this is a really big problem that's happening to young people um, over the past few months. What can we do about it? How can we commission a service to support this? How can we change what provision is already going on? And I also run quarterly locality meetings. So I meet with different um, stakeholders from Kent and Medway they get to network so we build the infrastructure of um, young people's support across Kent and Medway um, but also they just get to chat which I think in this sector sometimes you need that peer support you just need to chat with someone when you know you've had a bad day um, okay so this is the event I was talking about the young adults mental health and well-being conference we ran a conference we had basically we had commissioners heads of service, decision makers, young people, stakeholders, um, all come together. We use a community venue um, instead of a big corporate NHS building. Um, all of the money that they earned from our booking went back into the community centre. All the food that we didn't eat went to the um, food bank that the centre ran. Um, we had, um, in the morning, we had a few different presentations from stakeholders, from young people, from our data analysts. Um, and then in the afternoon, we had round table discussions with young people sitting on the table with um, the commissioners and other heads of service, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
and we've themed that data and it's very interesting very insightful and part of the feedback so we were doing if it would be better if um we have so much data and loads of people want to hold us accountable for not just holding the event but actually what are we going to do following the event um and not not practicing what it is. we need to practice what we preach mm -hmm. is non-tokenistic engagement and these are some of the young people and this this for me this is the most important not feeling alone and um, i feel more important than i thought and um, people are listening and um, we had and i'll be really quick <laughs> we had a young adult make this video for us we wanted to see the conference through young people's eyes it's only a minute long um, and i'd really like to share this with you Welcome to the Kevin Medway Young Adults Mental Health and Wellbeing Conference. We're really happy to welcome you today. It would be better if we were all kind and we just listened and we accepted every single person as a unique individual. Kenton Medway is committed to putting children and young people at the heart of what it does. We had Claire Murdoch, who is NHS England's National Mental Health Director, do a video for us. The lady you saw speaking was Dame Marlene Sills, um, who at the time was the Chief Nurse um, of Kent and Medway's ICB. So they were really behind us, and those are those systemic asks. Um, do we have 30 seconds to do this last slide? Though? Is that okay? So let me just come out of this. Um, and we're just going to ask one more slide, because we want to see if we've actually influenced you today, not just what we've got. And um, here we go. So you can use the same slide link. I thank you everyone for listening. You've been really great. I've seen some nods and some smiles. So yeah, I mean, as you, as you can see, a slightly different ways of uh, of working. Times now we don't kind of work directly, but we work together in our different in, in our organisations. Um, all the benefit of everyone as, as you do, and the way we collect lived experiences or we engage young people in gathering feedback is really important in what we do i'm and loving this the fact that the, absolutely and yes that yeah. even if there was one yes on there i feel like i've done my job today <laughs> so um that's okay. great that there's work already being done lived experience is powerful thank you we have uh so, um, yeah. i mean this 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 recording will be yeah. online anyway so okay. you can view these yeah um, online this is still open this slido um so if you want to keep writing we'll just pop our email address. so this will keep going so um you can still keep writing we're not like leaving you alone and um, we'll just i'll just pop the slido back on here are our um emails so if you would like to talk any more about any of this please um give us an email yeah and connect them so that's on uh, linkedin etc as well The panelists agreed they were open to a question or two oh, yes. after each yes. presentation. Oh, yes, we thought we would probably only have time for maybe two questions. So I see one hand at the back already. I am, I'm Kerry Mr. Nesta. Oh. I just wanted to say, uh, don't be, from a third sector perspective, it's important that we don't wait to be invited. Why I say that is because, you know, we now one of the delivery partners, I run a South Asian health charity, we're one of the delivery partners of our ICP on. On the NHS 420 prescribed for cancer, hypertension, and restricting. The reason why I kicked the doors out is because we weren't being engaged. So, as a result, we're now on the group. So, any third sector organizations here, don't be waiting to be asked, go and knock on their doors. And yeah. the work on mental health is it's, it's very important. And the transformation can only happen if the lived experience and co production is there on the onset. So, exactly. Um, I actually, prior to this role, I came from the third sector. I was a manager at a mental health charity for peer support. Um, and so I completely, completely get how you feel about, right, we shouldn't have to ask, we should be invited. So that's something I really push for and we're doing it. 
there is that that event that we ran they were what they were asked we didn't have to get any emails they were on the table so yes and, and to, to add on to that to that just finally is um if you if you look online on the Kenya Medway in the Great Cable website, we have a um, Kenya Medway um, VCSE uh, framework as well that anyone in the world can have a look at um, that looks at best practice and behaviors when you are either commissioning or using services. So have a look at the Kenya Medway VCSE framework, yeah, competency, competency framework. framework. Which is free to use. I can um, email well, it to you if you want to ping me an email. It's a really great document, really, really great. We will have time for more questions at the end. So, but another thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I love your talking about um, non tokenistic participation or engagement. Uh, and love to also think about what is, as well as not being tokenistic, what we want is for it to, to be genuine, meaningful, authentic. Uh, and when we do that, that what you promised in your speech title. We do see positive outcomes, and so thank you both for sharing so much. Uh, we're changing the order slightly. If you're following the program, we are joined by two presenters. Uh, one is here with us in person, so Carolyn Brooks. Uh, I read up your bio as well. A passionate advocate for using sport and recreation to reduce the global burden, I love that language, of non-communicable diseases. Um, and the way that you're leading the work in this space is incredible. Our other speaker is joining us from online. Um, Kaiwo is a young global leader um, experienced in health entrepreneurship, uh, <laughs> communications and international development. I have to say, when I was preparing for um, like today, this next line in Kaiwo's um, descriptor totally freaked me out. She is an experienced event compere, a panel moderator, <laughs> giving exquisite texture to every event. So um, hopefully uh, I'm almost living up to that standard as a panel moderator uh, and you're actively involved in transforming Africa's healthcare system. So they're going to share with us around youth lead consultations for the development of the Commonwealth Non-Communicable Diseases Strategy and Implementation <laughs> Plan. Round of applause for these two. All right. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, I am Taiwo Alawayimi, like our moderator has said. And today I will be sharing with us uh, key insights from the NCD's guiding framework uh, developed by the Commonwealth Youth Health Network in collaboration with the Commonwealth Secretariat. And I will be doing this alongside uh, Caroline, who is right there in the room with all of you. All right. Uh, like I said earlier, the NCD's guiding framework uh, is a collaboration between the Commonwealth Youth Health Network and the Commonwealth Secretariat. Uh, the Commonwealth Youth Health Network, as many of you, many of you may know, uh, is a youth-led network uh, that caters to the 56 Commonwealth member countries and is targeted and focused on health-related development goals. Uh, that young people face across the Commonwealth. And the NCDs are a key priority area for us. NCDs uh, largely, largely affect many countries in the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth is, has recorded some of the highest rates of diabetes and obesity in the world, and young people are among the most vulnerable. And that's why it's really important uh, to have this guiding framework that is youth-led, youth-centered, youth-focused, seeing that many of the risk factors and habits uh, that could lead to some of these NCDs are actually developed in our younger years. And that's why it's important for young people to not only be aware of this, but also take strategic actions uh, to drive prevention, uh, information, and advocacy. Uh, the guiding framework uh, is largely multifaceted because we ensure that we brought uh, diverse voices to the table uh, to be able to craft this framework. It's largely collaborative and localized, seeing that young people are advocates for change everywhere they find themselves, especially at the grassroots. So it was very interesting to be able to hear 
the thoughts of young people uh, in, 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 our, in our strategy sessions, in the focus group discussions, hear them talk about their thoughts on NCDs, what they know, what their perceptions and preferences for solutions for NCDs should be, and what the design and implementation process should look like. Uh, for us at the Commonwealth Youth Health Network, our focus for the guiding framework uh, are three key things, three key areas, leadership, advocacy, and youth-focused NCDs research. Leadership, having young people uh, take the lead on this, having young people be the ones to bring their voice to the table, be the ones to craft and draft the solutions, be the ones to conceptualize what the framework should look like. Young people also being the key advocates that they already are really, because we find young people championing change in different areas of their interest. And it's great to be able to bring such energy, bring such mindset to, to deliver uh, an ultimately healthier world for us all. And finally, the key focus area is youth-focused NCDs research. Yes, there are many NCDs, but we are largely focused on NCDs that most, most relate to young people so that young people can, can enjoy the largest benefit uh, from this framework. I'll invite uh, Caroline to take us on a deep dive into the framework and the implementation plan. Caroline? Thanks, Tyro. So just to jump in here to explain a bit more about why the Secretariat is investing in this area. As Tyro has mentioned, um, the Commonwealth is disproportionately affected by NCDs. We have a lot of small island states making up our 56 countries, and they're all very vulnerable to NCDs, particularly those um, linked to obesity and poor diet. A lot of foods that are, um, are consumed in small island states are imported. Um, there are environmental factors at play there, which means that they need some additional assistance really to try and combat this problem. Also, um, a major proportion of the Commonwealth audience are young people. So and we know that adults, adult habits are developed really in adolescent and childhood. So that's why we're focusing on a strategic piece of work that will help our member countries to address this issue now rather than waiting um, in you know 20 30 years when the young people have then developed NCDs later in life. Um, it's a four-year program of work so it's a, it's a commitment of significant resource um, but we have started this from a youth voice and a youth perspective from the outset and that will continue which I'll touch on later. So the next slide then just describes briefly what the process is that we've been doing. Um, so phase one to three is really what we're in now. Phase one is is completed. Phase two is that we have a draft framework at the moment, which we're consulting on. So we'll be expecting um, these network supporters with that. Uh, phase three is when we launch the framework itself, which is planned to be in November. And then four, five and six phases are really about mobilization and project launch, project delivery, pilot work with countries that really want to do this, Commonwealth moves campaign. And um, because the, the risk factors that this piece of work are particularly focusing on, of physical inactivity and poor diet. Um, hence why I'm the sport and SDGs project manager at the Commonwealth Secretariat and have a huge interest in how sport and physical activity can be better used here. So back to you, Taiwo. Thank you very much, Caroline. Like Caroline uh, rightly said, uh, phase one uh, largely involves us um, hearing from the young people to understand, to do a baseline assessment of their understanding of S NCDs and in fact the risk factors. We deployed the survey uh, across uh, young people in the Commonwealth and we got about 463 responses from young people to, to know exactly what they think NCDs are. And we've got quite interesting findings, which I will be sharing in the next slide. The results of the survey also helped us to be able to craft uh, focus group discussions uh, that served as consultation sessions with young people uh, across a number of days, across three days, uh, where we where we heard from young people from the five regions of the Commonwealth to, to gain insight on their knowledge, their perceptions, 
and preferences for reducing NCD burden across the Commonwealth. Uh, like Caroline said, we had three thematic areas in our in, in, in this in this project: diet, physical activity, and mental health. And the focus group discussions really were, were highlighting how these three areas impact NCDs. The findings that we got from the survey uh, were quite interesting. We, we, we were able to identify that about 61% of the young people that responded to the survey say that they are health conscious. And about 86% of them say they make healthy diet, diet decisions. But that somewhat contradicts uh, this quite high percentage we see here, 65% of whom say they consume sugar sweetened drinks. One would, one would want to think that if 86% of them think that they make healthy decisions, then we should have fewer of them <laughs> consuming uh, sugar sweetened drinks. So this survey somewhat denotes that the, the thoughts or the perceptions of the young people in the Commonwealth do not necessarily translate into actions in this case. And that shows that there's some work to do in that regard. We also asked young people among the Commonwealth uh, what they think about poor mental health. And about 49% of them uh, mentioned that poor mental health uh, is a concern for young people. One would expect that that percentage would be quite high, seeing that young people are at the forefront of mental health advocacy and interventions. Uh, and that's something uh, to really, really think about. Uh, you, you can also see here 51% of them saying they, they have healthy meals. Relate that also to the 86% who say that they make healthy decisions. One would expect that for for people who say they make healthy decisions, then they should eat balanced meals and should eat frequently. All right, uh, let's take a look at highlights from the focus group discussions. It's very interesting to note that the focus group discussions, yes, were youth-led, involved youth participation across the Commonwealth, but we also had an opportunity to exchange ideas with key stakeholders and policymakers across the three thematic areas uh, for this guiding framework. And one of the policymakers in the room uh, mentioned the need to restrict marketing of unhealthy food options. And this is very important given that we are, we are in the era in the digital era and we find that uh, the growth and sustainability of many companies ride on the impact of digital marketing and digital marketing impacts consumer choices and many young people live and breathe on social media <laughs> And, and that's very important to note it, it, we must help young people to make right uh, food choices, right diet choices. One of the young persons in the room from the Gambia mentioned the need to uh, integrate uh, the education ministry uh, in the implementation plan, especially to ensure that physical activities are, in, are an integral part of the curriculum as done already in the Gambia. Another young person in the room from India uh, mentioned uh, how many existing legislations on mental health are outdated and and, and this is a, this is very true we can see that in existence in many countries how existing laws and regulations on mental health legislations on mental health reinforce discrimination they don't support access to care and they are not youth, youth focused and these key highlights really form uh, the bedrock of of our of our strategy and the implementation plan that we will be uh, implementing in, in the next few months. Key learnings from, from this project really uh, highlighted here. One, partnerships. That partnerships are great, but not without challenges. Uh, we must uh, appreciate the Commonwealth uh, Secretariat for offering us the technical support to ensure that uh, this was effectively implemented. Many thanks to Caroline, who is the sports and SDG manager at the Commonwealth, who supported us all through the process. In fact, we in fact, we also had support uh, from a consultant as well who offered us guidance along the way. Another key learning from us was the need to be intentional about the diversity of voices that we brought to the table, seeing that the Commonwealth is a very diverse group already, and we wanted to be able to encapsulate the thoughts of these young people in the framework. And we needed to make sacrifices, especially considering time zones, time zones of young people. The Pacific region, uh, for instance, we realized that many of them are, are, are not able to access learning engagements like the focus group discussion we had. So we had to fix a time that we, we felt would be most 
convenient for them. Time investment as well. Yes, it, everybody knows that nothing good comes easy, right? And we had to invest a lot of time and resources to ensure that this was as effective as possible. Uh, and I should also mention the, the challenge of data. Data is quite expensive in some regions of the Commonwealth. Unstable network also posed some challenges in the course of the in the course of the focus group discussions that we had along across extended periods of time. It's also important to mention um, regional differences, regional differences uh, across the Commonwealth. Some persons had certain opinions that seemed quite uh, realistic to their regions, but didn't seem to be feasible in some regions. It just showed us that our framework shouldn't be a one size fit all approach. It should be one that is flexible uh, and that meets the diverse needs of the people, of the young people of the Commonwealth. And finally, uh, a key point for us was teamwork, joint problem solving. We had help from different different levels, from the Commonwealth Secretariat, even from within the Commonwealth Youth Health Network. Uh, we had young people from within the network volunteering as facilitators. I, for one, volunteered as one of the facilitators to drive the conversation during the focus group discussions. And ultimately, we're able to see that uh, having these contributions from different quarters helped us to to, uh, to craft uh, quite creative solutions. Right. I'll, I'll hand over again to Caroline who will share next steps uh, for this project. Caroline. Thanks, Tyro. So yeah, so what we did with all of that is just make sure the young people were in the driving seat throughout. So whilst the Secretariat was, were in the background, we very much allowed the young people to design, um, reach out to all the people that they wanted to reach out to, and then they facilitated the session. So we were there to support. We didn't want to influence at all. So it was youth-led from the start, um, hopefully not tokenistic either. Um, so in terms of our next step, because the power that, that generated that, that youth-led approach, we're committed to continuing it. So um, we want the NCD draft um, guiding framework to be consulted upon, led by young people. Um, we're going to create a dedicated Commonwealth NCD's youth working group um, to bring in some people with lived experiences, make sure that the youth voice continues to be represented, not just in the implementation of this piece of work, but across all of the platforms where NCDs are, are spoken about. Um, we're looking to launch our, our writing framework in November at the London Global Cancer Week. So um, if anybody is planning to attend that, then hopefully you'll hear more about it then. And then finally, we have three sort of work streams that will follow, one on policy and advocacy, one on community engagement and empowerment, and work stream three on network partnerships and training. Now, originally we thought the young people would fit well in work stream two, but we're going to make sure that they're embedded in every single one because we think that that their voice is really a, an asset for us to use and um, not only are they going to be beneficiaries of this piece of work but we need to try and ensure young people take action now so that they're not the burden of ncds in the future okay i think we're nearly at the end next i think you'll you'll finish us off tyro absolutely all right well said caroline thank you very much for that i would definitely look forward to uh interesting findings even as we implement this project and we look forward to having the diverse voices of young people uh, as we implement this framework ultimately we all understand and agree that young people having young people at the center of an all important conversation like the NCDs uh, really, really will build well, not only for our communities, our local communities, but indeed the Commonwealth, indeed the world as a whole. And we look forward to the support and partnership of member states to ensure that together we can reduce the burden of NCDs in the Commonwealth. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you both so much. And a particular thank you for thinking of the time zone in the Pacific. I join a number of Commonwealth meetings at ridiculous times during the day. And so I love the way you adapted um, and just so appreciate in New Zealand, the link between well-being and active recreation is something that we are actively seeing a youth lead response to. So I want to talk to you at lunchtime. So we only have time until until 12pm. Uh,
Um, so the chances for, we will take a, a couple of extra minutes for questions now, uh, because she won't be here at the end when we will have a, hopefully have an opportunity for, for questions. I will just let you know that lunch has been pushed back to 12.20. So that's the time we're aiming to finish. So any questions or feedback from the floor, floor for either Carolyn or um, I will. Yes. Um, what initially motivated Tyro to get involved in this work? She might not have heard that. Do you hear that, Tyro? What What motivated you to get involved in this work? Oh, wow. Uh, for me, I've got a background in healthcare for one. I'm a pharmacist by training, so that makes me very love already with anything healthcare. Right. And having the opportunity to volunteer on the team, the Commonwealth Youth Health Network, uh, for me, the motivation to even join in the first place was because I wanted to understand uh, what global health advocacy was at that level. And I wanted to have that opportunity to engage with young people across the world. And having such a project like this was timely, gave me that opportunity to have hands-on involvement in co-creating this solution alongside other young chain makers across the Commonwealth so that together we can achieve universal healthcare coverage, which is a key, key aspect of the Sustainable Development Goals. So yes, that's why. Thank you. Great question. Great answer. <laughs> Any other questions? Just a question. You've you mentioned time as a as a resource, but was it's also important that young know, people get recompensated for you mentioned data was a challenge, also free compensation of giving their time and expertise or, or involvement. So is that being fractured in in terms of the project itself? Just passed the question so Kai Warner knows as well, but I suspect he might be answering. Oh, the question was around uh, young people being recognized uh, and paid for their time um, in this project. So we, we did recognise that some incentives might be required in the outset. So for our survey, we had several prizes available for um, people who responded. And I think that did actually positively affect the response rates, which were really high for us. Um, it is more tricky when you're trying to kind of consult from um, on a remote virtual basis. It does rely on Internet connection. Um, but we we did it in a, in a way that brought in it to try and accommodate the time zones um well you know you we you know we couldn't avoid really this if, if, if they don't have data then they can't consult but that is something that we will continue to work on and make sure that you know we've got focal points in each country so it's not like we're just going to manage this from marlborough house in london this is going to go to granular levels on on the ground to make sure the voices are heard um, but it was a challenge it was a challenge trying to do this remotely over teams and zoom um, but i think we did pretty well tara did you have anything else to add to that around the kind of incentives and the the, the ways that we can weave, weave that in in future okay yeah you know the, the match of incentives can be quite tricky right because uh, it could mean different things to different people. For some persons, it could be monetary. For some persons, it is that sheer commendation that you offer them for a job well done. Uh, for some persons, uh, please confirm if you can still hear me. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Yes. Okay, fantastic. So for some persons, it's an opportunity to be engaged directly uh, at, at this kind of level, to have a voice. Uh, in the co-creation of projects with grand impact, right? I, I, I recall that we had offered some incentives, vouchers, I think, to people who responded to the surveys. That was fantastic. Like Caroline rightly said, it could be sometimes difficult to identify how well to compensate one, especially on a, when remote consultation is offered. But like I also said as well, uh, Incentives could mean different things to different people. For me, who in fact volunteered as a facilitator, who is volunteering on the team of the of the policy advocacy and research committee of the Commonwealth Youth Health Network, how much money would you pay me uh, to make you feel satisfied and fulfilled? I'm not <laughs> sure you can. I'm not sure you can pay me well. <laughs> but but that sheer fulfillment of being a part of something big, I think that is what fulfillment. That's what. That's a great incentive for me as a person. And I think for many young people who are passionate about chain making and global impact. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Taiwo and Caroline, for your presentations and reminding us with your question that actually paying young people for their time is important. 
but money is only one of the ways that we're able to do that. Um, so thank you both so much. Thank you for joining us online. Okay. And, uh, thank you. Bye. Our final presenter asked an excellent question before. So um, Danny is going to join us. The words that stood out for me from his um, bio that I think probably capture, hopefully, aspects, key aspects of who you are, is that it's on your heart um, to support young people finding out who they are, what they need, and making a change in the world. So we're looking forward to hearing from you on the impact of participation and decision making on young people's mental health and well-being. Um, great, so I'm, I'm here today coming from Norfolk, um, uh, working at a, a youth charity that um, uh, that works, works in a very place-based way in the county of Norfolk in the east of England, um, but has a vision to change the world from, from our little uh, corner of the, of the world. Um, I'll just run through my, what's going to be in the presentation, so um, I've got it, got it in three parts. Um, for, firstly, I want to, to um, uh, to, to share a little bit about uh, what we do at MAP, the variety of projects we have that are involving young people and the decisions that affect them uh, and passions of young people and about our outcomes focused participatory practice. Um, secondly, I'm going to talk about an evaluation that we commissioned um, from an independent researcher to analyse the uh, correlate between uh, participating in change-making activities and the well-being impact on individuals um, and about their methods. Um, and finally, share with you um, the findings from that evaluation. And that's the main focus of, of the presentation. So I'm gonna whistle through parts one and two and spend the majority of my uh, 15 to 20 minutes um, focusing on the findings from, from that evaluation. Uh, so starting with a brief description of MAP and the variety of projects we have um, it, at, at our organisation. <laughs> um, we've, um, uh, what I've got here are the, the logos from a range of projects. Um, our, the team that I oversee has 17 different projects, many of which are involved in uh, young people having a say over the decisions that affect them. The banner across the top is um, seven youth advisory boards. So every district in Norfolk has a youth advisory board made up of young people and professionals representing schools and health and so on. Um, and they're making decisions about how government money is spent on youth services. Um, uh, in addition to lots of uh, individuals change making activities and, and activism projects. We set up something called the Young Activist Network, which is paying young people to develop their activism practice. So whatever activism they're already doing, we're paying them to expand that and develop that because we know that, that young people shouldn't just be giving all of their uh, time for free uh, on change making activities. Um, and another project which is particularly relevant for uh, my NHS colleagues in, in Kent is um, a project called Youth in Mind, which is funded by our local ICB and NHS um, to, to spend a very, very, very small proportion of its budget um, on uh, making sure that young people are involved in shaping um, the, the design and delivery of mental health services locally. Um, key sort of uh, uh, elements of that one is that we've created a board of young people that sit alongside the exec management group of senior clinicians um, uh, uh, conducting a parallel agenda with the exec management group on a monthly basis and shaping the decisions that are uh, made for the whole of the, the county. Um, another uh, real piece of success is developing a charter written by young people for uh, all of the staff working across mental health workforces um, in Norfolk to uh, explain what, what young people want from the service when they step through the door into a, a treatment room, into a counselling service or any other mental health intervention. That's a range of kind of projects um, that young people are involved in. And MAP takes a, 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 an outcomes focused approach to, to our work. So we have an outcomes framework um, which uh, uses this young foundation grid of uh, how uh, of how um, individual changes for, in, uh, for young people can contribute to greater capabilities interpersonally and ultimately in society. So so um, so the uh, yeah, we 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 um we're observing all the time the work, the impact of our youth work on young people's personal, interpersonal, and social um capabilities. Um, young people co-produced this report, a better future together, which was what led to the commissioning of, of the youth and mind service that uh, that um involves young people in design and delivery of, of mental health services. 
Um, I guess key features of our outcomes focus um, framework are uh, firstly believing in early intervention and um, that the earlier we, we help young people, the, the um, uh, le less um, need for clinical services down the line and critical services. Um, secondly, that we'll be youth led. So, so we're not going to um, uh, develop any services if we haven't asked young people what, um, what they want from it. Um, uh, and um, uh, yeah. That, that's it, I think, and, and quality. Yeah, it was reflected in the plenary yesterday that, that the, we know the quality of the outcomes from the quality of the inputs and, and the youth workers that provide that. That's our, our approach. And uh, you're all familiar with um, with the hearts that are participation and obviously always wanting to create as, as um, uh, rich co-creation as we can. OK, so on to um, this uh, evaluation that I've been um, asked to, to present on today. Um, so we uh, we um we we had a hypothesis which is quite quite a simple simple uh, suggestion that getting involved in youth voice projects will lead to improvements in young people's mental and emotional health and well-being. So I think it's often often very clear to see what the impact is of involving young people in change making. Um, they uh, wanted a skate park and we developed a skate park and now young people are enjoying that skate park. Um, but it's less easy to understand what changes for an individual as part of, of change making activities. And I'm interested in, in some of the uh, uh, a study that is being done around employer uh, job satisfaction and so on, having a sense of belonging and purpose leading to increased job satisfaction. But I think there's very little study of what is the impact on young people's mental health and well-being when they're involved in change making activities and, and involved in participatory projects. And I'm sure this, this little piece of research is relevant to, to lots of other sectors too. I was proud to learn that 93% of the young people that took part in this evaluation um, indicated that their uh, participating in the group had a positive impact, not just on the wider world, but on themselves as individuals too. So the, the methods um, were threefold, so a cross-sectional online survey, semi-structured interviews with young people and a series of focus groups. Um, so that was giving us a, a range of sort of light touch and more in-depth feedback from young people. Uh, next, I'll introduce the, the uh, consultants that, that led this independent research. So um, James Kenrick is the ex chief executive of uh, an organisation called Youth Access, which is an umbrella body for youth information advice and counselling services in England um, and is now an independent policy and research consultant. And um, the research was sort of validated and, and supported by Charlotte Woodhead, um, uh, who's at King's College London um, and took a, a special um, and free uh, gr gr uh, gratis um, interest in in this um, this piece of research, um, and the findings were were really um, inspiring for us. So, I'm um, adding together those that said that their um, health and well-being improved a bit and a lot by taking part in that range of projects I outlined. Um, we got to a total of um, 87% um, feeling that their health and well-being had been directly improved by being part of a group that was actively um, involved in change making. Um, I was very excited to share with my, my team that 100% that of young people say they feel, felt safe and heard at our, our groups, and that's really important. And I think we would be upset if it was anything less than 100%. 89% um, talk about the diversity of their groups, meeting young people from different walks of life and backgrounds. In particular, 13% are non-binary, transgender and non-conforming. 80% um, having suffered a mental health problem. 45% eligible for free school meals. Um, and that's just a, a sampling of some of the, the um, key stats indicating the kind of diversity of our, our reach. Um, and then, then we get to some of these tables that I'll, I'll try and summarise um, yeah, a, a bit more succinctly and, and um, uh, not wade into, into the detail. But um, uh, this is a, a list of, of the kinds of um, uh, factors and protected characteristics that we were looking at in terms of participation. And reflects not just participation in this evaluation, but, but the wider engagement within our groups. Next, we have um, yeah, mental health and well-being improvements. I've already shared those bigger stats, um, but but these are key as well. So we were looking at the sense of feeling part of something, feeling more part of my community, having a stronger sense of purpose, improved confidence, all of which we think are correlated with um, with uh, mental health and well-being. Um, and yeah, looking at uh, stress levels, feelings about the future, we, we used a combination of um, psychometrics that have already been very well developed and validated and new questions that young people uh, told us to include in the survey that helped us um, understand uh, what the indicators might be for, for well-being. Um, and yeah, an increased sense of belonging. For, for, for me, this, this was probably uh, the most 
um, intuitive um, uh, thought that I had before we embarked on, on this um, evaluation was that being part of these groups that are making a change in the world around us gives you a sense of belonging and a sense of being part of a community. My, my instinct was that, that um, high um, stats like this would, would be the greatest indication of, of uh, good mental health and well-being as being part of the, the groups. Um, sense of the range of issues that, that are um, uh, covered by, by the groups that we run. Um, so many young people are involved in making changes in mental health services through that Youth in Mind project. Um, young people are actively involved in addressing bullying in the council, in the county. So um, they host an annual conference called Norfolk Youth Against Bullying, um, where they invite different speakers um, every year, uh, professionals to, to talk alongside them about the issues affecting bullying. And they're really trying to change school policies about bullying. So we're spending time in, in um, lots of schools in Norfolk to get them to, to create more um, young person friendly uh, anti-bullying policies um, and then a range of, of other issues. We've got a, a cop out conference that we run annually that um, young people uh, have developed uh, around climate change and um, climate anxiety. Um, yeah, and, and uh, at the moment we've got a disability awareness um, campaign young people are leading around creating inclusive play parts. There are um, frightfully few inclusive play parts in, in England and um, none in Norfolk and so we're trying to get one set up. Um, range of, sense of the, the range of activities. So um, young people are involved at all kinds of different levels. Um, and that is really important. If you look at sort of um, so uh, the Sheila McKechnie social change grid, we need change to be happening from lots of different angles. So it's not enough to just be um, rioting in the streets. That, um, and it's not enough to just uh, speak truth to power and get platforms with, with senior execs that might be able to, to change things. But we need to try a whole range of different approaches. And so this gives you a sense of the, the spread of uh, approaches that young people develop. So we might provide a bit of um, uh, workshop around what are the different ways that we could have achieved change and young people obviously decide what, what kind of change they want to create and what, what mechanisms they're gonna use to achieve that change. Um, another sort of uh, um, impact of, of, of the work that I, I guess I, I was surprised and heartened by is that, uh, that young people taking part in change making projects improve their understanding of the, the range of services that are out there to support them. And so um, they they get themselves a really good grounding in understanding what 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 um young what other services young people can access. And so there are lots of good services out there, just often young people don't know that it's there. And so young people that are involved in change making activities tend to be really good ambassadors and signposters of, of all, all the good stuff happening locally. Um, and yeah, a couple of nice, um, nice quotes from from young people. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, this is just one of one of my favorite favorites, just because it um admitted that um the the ways that that youth work can change lives is it's a bit cheesy to say, but it's really true. Um, uh. Uh, yeah, I was proud proud to understand the impact that youth workers have. Um, I've said this morning that, that as a baseline, we see a relationship of of trust and and uh, and uh, mutual respect are are essential uh, foundations for any work to happen. Um, but I really don't think you can underestimate the quality of that relationship and how distinct that youth work relationship is compared with other walks of life. Um, so, so that is a re really integral ingredient. Um, the researcher um, conducting this evaluation highlighted these four um, uh, conclusions as, as being the, the main factors um, leading to improved uh, mental health and well-being. So feeling heard, feeling welcomed, um, feeling like you're making a difference and having better awareness of mental health and the mental health system. Um, so, um, yeah, and I think, um, yeah, I, I, on feeling heard, it's not just um, creating a, a talking shop, but but feeling like people that can really influence change are listening to you. That, that's in particular um, uh, important on that point. Uh, and yeah, finally, trying to understand so that it can be replicated. What, what are the foundations for an impactful um, program? So it is about that environment and that atmosphere that youth workers create first, first and foremost, um, but also being the, these activities being a conduit to other support and other services as and when they're needed by young people, um, making sure they are really representative groups and, and inclusive of a, a diverse range of voices um, uh, and not in an echo chamber. And, um, and then providing real access to decision makers. And, and that's often where we're coming in as professionals is that we're able to create those links and, and networks for young people to then have the platforms to, to make the changes they wanna see. Um, 
That's it. I've, I've, I've tried to, to um, um, speed through it. So, um, so I, yeah, we've got up to 10 minutes and hopefully won't take that long for, for any questions that you might have and so that we can um, get down to the lunch hall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, so climate anxiety comes out very top in, in a lot of our um, surveys um, recently. So um, every year as an organisation and alongside young people, we go out and survey roughly 10% of the population of 11 to 19 year olds in Norfolk. Um, and this, this, for the last two years running, uh, climate change has been one of the top five issues for, for young people. Um, mm -hmm. in, in Norfolk in particular, then we we can drill down to specific issues like we have a lot of coastal communities and they're observing whole villages falling into the sea um, and that gives them anxiety um, but but also um, more broadly feeling like uh, our governments and our institutions aren't actively responding well enough to to the climate crisis um, so so that is a, a big pressing concern for lots of young people yeah mm -hmm. can i just um, advocate on your behalf something that you you had so much information to give across there. Yeah. I know Matt very well. I'm oh, great. In Norfolk. Oh, great. Um, yeah. One of the, the great things about your anti-bullying conferences mm. is that they're run by young people. Yeah. And it's a lived experience they share makes it so powerful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and we've been hearing that throughout all of the talks that, that when young people speak from the horse's mouth, as it were, it's so much more impactful and inspiring. So it's disappointing that I'm here to speak on their behalf because it, um, they would give a, a more powerful uh, presentation, I'm sure. <laughs> absolutely. Incredible yeah. content, though. Mm. Questions for Ben? Question, but it's probably directed at all speakers mm. um, th th this morning. So, if that's okay. Segue, so maybe uh, other speakers <laughs> could come to the front. <laughs> Do you want to cheer, friends, or are you happy to stand? Happy to stand? Probably our online people aren't hearing these questions either. So I might stand over here and repeat the question so they can hear um, and then we can hear from the panelists. Thank you and thanks for all the contributions this morning. Um, it's really interesting to hear from young people who are, have access to decision makers and we hear how young people are developing frameworks and guidance um no uh, a guidance that will, will be launched um, as well was my, my next question is then about how do these frameworks and access to decision makers have a significant impact on future generations in terms of changes because we heard yesterday about the, the personal changes, the cultural changes, and then the um, structural changes. So how do you anticipate those guidance frameworks being produced and the, and, and the conversations with decision makers to enable then that long lasting sustainable change that moves all from a framework into long lasting implementation? I'm just yeah. going to summarise for the people online. Okay. But that was a Incredibly framed question, but really the question is: is the good work that you're doing? How is that going to impact future generations? Yeah. What do we see the long-term changes? I think. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say. So a lot of the feedback we hear, and I'm sure a lot of you hear it as well, is that the uh, mental health system seems to be set up on crisis treatment rather than crisis prevention. So we hear that a lot through our projects and through um, our engagement with young people. Hopefully for future generations, it will get to a point where the primary care network and social and, and sort of holistic care network will be bolstered up enough and the access for young people to have voices in commissioning decisions and frameworks um, means that it takes time. These like this organic change takes time. It could take a decade, but with that change, hopefully it will be a case of the service services will be so robust in those 
first stages of med obviously I'm talking from a mental health perspective, but hopefully they'll be robust enough that there's less pressure on secondary care services, so CAMS, um, that that will the need for that will lessen. So the funding that's going into it can actually give uh, a strong support for children and young people needing to access it. So that's what we're hearing now, and it's directly going to commissioners. So that will influence and impact direct change for young people who are zero to, to whatever right now. I still feel like people born in 2000s so are like <laughs> one years old. So, um, and they're in their 20s, which is kind of scary, but hopefully that answers part of your question. Um, could, I, could I add to that as well? So because we recognise that um, what influences a young person is a whole system of influences. So the, the framework that we're developing um, has at its heart that whole system approach and not just words. We're talking about uh, using our Commonwealth influence at the ministerial upstream level, so policy level. That's our bread and butter stuff, which we we do all the time. So every ministerial meeting in the coming months is going to have NCDs and our youth voice represented. That's our aim. Um, but we also recognise that for long term change of behaviour and mindsets, we need a ground up, bottom up. Um, downstream we call it approach so we are that's where we think the youth voice the advocates like Taiwo can come in very handily that they can be the agents of change on the ground and demanding that young people um, demand that policies changed and, and and that it's and that that legacy then continues for the future generation so we're we're tackling it at both ends to make sure that that it's a sustainable impact I mean that's a fantastic question so I think as your name Oh, sorry, my name's June. I'm from outside yeah. Glasgow. Ah, fun, fun, no, brilliant, brilliant question. Because actually, why do we do all these um, activities and programs? And I think you know, part part of what we were doing is about building those partnerships and the voices. If you've got the Commonwealth here and hearing and listening and acting on that, it's about that system change. Um, there was a conversation yesterday about um, impact tracking, impacts on what we are doing. So we need to make sure we continue these conversations with the young people who are involved today throughout their life, because there will be other young people who are coming in, and these are the people who are contributing to this, and the services they are designing will impact them and their families um, in the future. So it is really about changing that system through partly influence and partly the conversations with organizations like the Commonwealth or the United Nations, but on a local level, we are influencing the strategies in our own organizations with our partners as well. So that has to continue, but we need to be measuring that impact progressively and make sure we don't regress because the challenge will always, especially with young people involved, this is the call now in five or 10 years time, we might have a slightly different system, funding arrangement might change, et cetera. And then again, another 10 years time, we come back to the same situation again, it's a cycle. So we need to make sure we stop that cycle and have a progression outcome. I think with that as well, stopping siloed working, I think that's actually inhibiting change because money has been put in different projects, different areas, and no one's communicating. So if we're commissioning different things in different areas, everyone's saying the same thing, that's hindering progress because we're not putting, we're not using resource in the right way. So I think with that comes sort of trying to stop siloed working in a way. Just let Danny have the the last word um, yeah just it's a really important question and to be real with young people about about what is the scale of your ambition what kind of time frame are you working over to have small wins and bigger long-term projects that you're aiming at and acknowledging that that we might work very intensely with young people for a period of time but they grow up and so as youth workers we might stop working with that group of young people so to have elements that are sustainable but i think yeah just being being really concrete about about the scale of your ambition yeah yeah Thank you, friends, and thank you to our online. Oh, one, one more. There was one over there as well. There were two questions. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. What project management methodology are you using in your projects, just in general, for anybody? You mean digitally or just? So in terms of your project management, like your approach in your project. So because I think in terms of project management, we need more of a kind of standardization, but we might have that already. So it's just that this time, like how to put it, what approach do you take, but what methodology do you use? I mean for, for me, anyway, I'm, 
you know, it's more agile. So, you know, it, things shift quite quickly because you might have to implement things quite quickly um, over a short space of time. So you need to be working quite, you know, with, with a lot of stakeholders to get to the next solution. Um, some of the challenges here is that funding might be available at a very short notice for you to deliver a certain project. Um, and so therefore that limits you from wanting to have big project plan um, like Prince2, which might not work necessarily. But for me, you know, using an agile model, which is quite flexible, quite progressive at each point, uh, seems to work better. A great question. Are you going to add? No, I was just going to say, I think with, um, and I was mentioning about writing the lived experience framework, because it's so new, I think we're sort of getting little bits here and there of what's working, but anybody, well, you all work with young people, it has to be flexible and agile and you have to read the room almost. And young people may not understand the theories of project management, but actually that's really exciting because we get to see what they want to bring to project management management, and we get to develop that with them. So we're sort of creating a hybrid of what we consider best practice and what they consider best practice and amalgamate it. So we're sort of writing our new ones. Who's going to take the name? I don't know. <laughs> Some theory of change. I understand there's a question over this side. Last question. There was a question over there. Oh, that side. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anita from the Royal College of Pediatrics. Um, so my question was, great work by the way, um, all of you guys. My question was, um, about the follow through for new people. So a lot of new people say that their voice is heard, they do a lot of co-production, a lot of consultations, and we come up with some amazing reports, but they, that nobody necessarily feeds back to them. They want to mm -hmm. impact of that and how that data is then used. So that's the question to you, Kathy. Is, is that something you do? <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, did anyone else want to come in before you I start waffling? Um, so I think I mentioned about um, the conference, we have written actions and sent out reports to all the delegates of that conference and said that people, one of the biggest themes that came through from it is that people wanted accountability, that it wasn't just we've held this conference and so we're, I'm, we're going to be accountable and I'm going to make sure we action what is being said. Um, I think that there's always competing needs as well. Um, young people may say they want something, but then realistically, if there's NHS red tape round money, if there's um, different things that you can't do because of certain policies, it's it's um, opening that expectation of, we can't always do what you say, but we'll try our best. Um, I think a dream for me would be that co-production is not called co-production, it's just called production. And that's our standard of practice and we won't have to chase up um, that sort of thing. We we will just action it as normal and it just happens. So, yeah, I think it's accountability, but holding the people who make those decisions to account as well, even if that means rubbing up some people the wrong way, it needs to be done. We have to feel uncomfortable, don't we? Um, people have been feeling too uncomfortable, uh, too comfortable for too long. And uh, there was an article recently about how we um dilute lived experience to make it palatable for us well not necessarily us we hear it from the horse's mouth so to speak um but we've got to challenge that make people feel a bit uncomfortable make them hear what we hear um and not sugarcoat it so i hope that answers yeah. in a way and uh, just to reinforce your point basically that that um it's it's the thing that leads to apathy most often when when young people give their input and then don't get find out what comes as a result and so it's just really important that we are closing the feedback loop uh, however in whatever way that we do that but yeah it's really really good point it's, yeah that engagement I, I was just gonna say communication is the is the key thing isn't it but often there's an unavoidable time lag between the consultation activities and then reporting and i think every organization tries to minimize that but it's inevitable so it's being open open and honest with the consultees from the start to say there might be a delay before we are able to involve you again but that's not because we've not respected your views or valued your inputs it's just that things can take some time to get these difficult things through processes so. hey friends it is lunch time so let's do a big thank you to the panelists Thank you to our rapporteur who has taken amazing notes, Peter, for us. <laughs> and Barry, who has done a great job online keeping us going. Thank you.
Just before we leave, I do need to close us because when we open a space with karakia um, in New Zealand, we also close the space. I'll use the same karakia. So it's a blessing of peace over us all. When I finish, it will be tihei and together we'll say mauri ora. Okay? Uh, so kai nui tato. Ayo ki te rangi. Ayo ki te whenua. Ayo ki na tangata o te ao. Tihei, tihei. Enjoy your lunch, friends.